हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई एम अदिति वेलकम टू माई चैनल लाइब्रेरी माउस टूडे आई एम गोइंग टू रीड अ बुक हाउ टू डेवलप सेल्फ कॉन्फिडेंस एंड इन्फ्लुएंस पीपल बाई पब्लिक स्पीकिंग बाई डेल कानिगी दिस बुक कंटेन टूल्व चैप्टर्स लेट्स कंटिन्यू विथ चैप्टर वन फर्स्ट स्टार्ट विथ अ स्ट्रॉन्ग एंड परसिस्टेंट डिजायर दिस इज ऑफ फार मोर इम्पॉर्टेंस then you probably realize if an instructor could look into your mind and heart now and as certain the depth of your desires he could foretell almost with certainty the swiftness of the progress you will make if your desire is pale and flabby your achievements will also take on that you and consistency but if you go after your subject with persistence and with the energy of a bulldog after a cat nothing underneath the milky way will defeat you therefore arouse your enthusiasm for this self study enumerate its benefits think of what additional self confidence and the ability to talk more conventionally in public will mean to you think of what it may mean and what it ought to mean in dollars and cents think of what it may mean to you socially of the friends it will bring of the increase of your personal influence of the leadership it will give you and it will give you leadership more rapidly than almost any other activity you think of or imagine there is no other accomplishment started chauncey m depew which any man can have that will so quickly make for him a career and secure recognition as the ability to speak acceptably philosopher d armour after he had amassed millions said I would rather have been a great speaker than a great capitalist. It is an attainment that almost every person of education longs for. After Henry Carnegie's death, there was found among his papers a plan for his life drawn up when he was 33 years of age. He then felt that in two more years he could so arrange his business as to have an annual income of 50,000. So he proposed to retire at 35 go to Oxford and get a thorough education and pay special attention to speaking in public think of the glow of satisfaction and pleasure that will occur from the exercise of this new power the author has traveled around over no small part of the world and has had many and varied experiences but for downright and lasting inward satisfaction He knows of few things that will compare to standing before an audience and making men think your thoughts after you. It will give you a sense of strength, a feeling of power. It will appeal to your pride of personal accomplishment. It will set you off from and raise you above your fellow men. There is magic in it and a never to be forgotten thrill. 2 minutes before I begin, a speaker confessed, "I would rather be whipped than start." but 2 minutes before i finish i would rather be shot than stop in every effort some men grow faint hearted and fall by the wayside so you should keep thinking of what this skill will mean to you until your desire is white hot you should start this program with an enthusiasm that will carry you through from end to the end set aside one certain night of the week for the reading of these chapters in short make it as easy as possible to go ahead Make it as difficult as possible to read read. When Julius Caesar sailed over the channel from Gaul and landed with the legions on what is now England, what did he do to ensure the success of his arms? A very clear thing. He halted his soldiers on the chalk cliff of Dover and looking down over the waves 200 feet below, they saw red tongues of fire consume every ship in which they had crossed. In the enemy's country with the last link with the continent gone the last means to retreating burned there was but one thing left from them to do to advance to conquer that is precisely what they did such was the spirit of the immortal kaiser why not make it yours too in this war to exterminate any foolish fear of audience point number 2 know thoroughly what you are going to talk about Unless a person has thought out and planned his talk and know what he is going to say, he can't feel very comfortable when he faces his auditors. He is like the blind leading the blind. Under such circumstances, your speaker ought to be self-conscious, ought to be feel repentant, ought to be ashamed of his negligence. I was elected to the legislature in the fall of 1881. 
Teddy Roosevelt wrote in his autobiography and found myself the youngest man in that body. Like all young men and inexperienced members, I had considerable difficulty in teaching myself to speak. I profited much by the advice of a hard-headed old countryman who was unconsciously paraphrasing the Duke of Wellington who was himself doubtless paraphrasing somebody else. The advice ran, don't speak until you are sure you have something to say and know just what it is, then say it and sit down. This hard-headed old countryman ought to have told Roosevelt of another aid in overcoming nervousness. He ought to have added, it will help you to throw off embarrassment if you can find something to do before an audience. If you can exhibit something, write a word on the blackboard or point out a spot on the map or move a table or throw open a window or shift some books and papers any physical action with a purpose behind it may help you to feel more at home. True, it is not always easy to find an excuse for doing such things. But there is the suggestion. Use it if you can, but use it the first few times only. A baby does not cling to chairs after it once learns to walk. Point number 3. Act confident. One of the most famous psychologists that America had produced, Professor William James wrote as follows, Action seems to follow feeling, but really action and feeling go together. And by regulating the action, which is under the more direct control of the will, we can indirectly regulate the feeling, which is not. Thus, the sovereign voluntary path of cheerfulness, if our spontaneous cheerfulness be lost, is to sit up cheerfully and to act and speak as if cheerfulness were already there. If such conduct does not make you feel cheerful, nothing else on that occasion can. So to feel brave, act as if we were brave. Use all of our will to that end, and a courage fit will very likely replace to fit or fail. Apply Professor James' advice. To develop courage when you are facing an audience, act as if you already had it. Of course, unless you are prepared, all the acting in the world will evil but little. But granted that you know what you are going to talk about, step out briskly and take a deep breath. In fact, breathe deeply for 30 seconds before you ever face your audience. The increased supply of oxygen will buy you up and give you courage. The great tenor, Jean de Rizky, used to say that when you had your breath, so you could sit on it, nervousness vanished. In every age, in every climb, men have always admired courage. So no matter how your heart may be pounding inside, stride forth bravely, stop, stand, still and act as if you loved it. Draw yourself up to your full height. Look your audience straight in the eyes and begin to talk as confidently as if every one of them owed you money. Imagine that they do. Imagine that they have assembled there to beg you for an extension of credit. The psychological effect on you will be beneficial. Do not nervously button and unbutton your coat. Play with your beats or fumble with your hands. If you must make nervous movements, place your hands behind your back and twist your fingers there where no one can see the performance or wiggle your toes. As a general rule, it is bad for a speaker to hide behind furniture. But it may give you a little courage the first few times to stand behind a table or chair and to grip them tightly or hold a coin firmly in the palm of your hand. How did Teddy Roosevelt develop his characteristic courage and self-reliance? Was he endowed by nature with a venturesome and daring spirit? Not at all. Having been a rather sickly and awkward boy, he confessed in his autobiography, I was as a young man at first both nervous and distrustful of my own prowess. I had to train myself painfully and laboriously not merely as regards my body but as regards my soul and spirit. Fortunately, he has told us how he achieved the transformation. When a boy, he writes, I read a passage in one of Merit's book which always impressed me. In this passage, the captain of some small British men of war is explaining to the hero how to acquire the quality of fearlessness. 
He says that at the outset almost every man is frightened when he goes into action but that the course to follow is for the man to keep such a grip on himself that he can act just as if he were not frightened after this is kept up long enough it changes from pretense to reality and the man does in very fact become fearless by sheer dint of practicing fearlessness when he does not feel it this was the theory upon which i went there were all kinds of things of which i was afraid at first ranging from greasy bears to mean horses and gun fighters but by acting as if i was not afraid i gradually ceased to be afraid most men can have the same experience if they choose you can have that very experience too if you wish in war said marshal fort the best defensive is an offensive so take the offensive against your fears go out to meet them battle them conquer them by sheer boldness at every opportunity have a message and then think of yourself as a western union boy instructed to deliver it we pay slight attention to the boy it is the telegram that we want the message that is the thing keep your mind on it keep your heart in it know it like the back of your hand believe it willingly then talk as if you were determined to say it do that and the chances are 10 to 1 that you will soon be master of the occasion and master of yourself point number 4 practice practice and practice the last point we have to make here is emphatically the most important even though you forgot everything you have read so far to remember this The first way, the last way, the never failing way to develop self confidence in speaking is to speak. Really, the whole matter finally simmers down to but one essential: practice, practice, practice. That is the sine qua non of it all. The without which not. Any beginner, Von Roosevelt, is apt to have buck fever. Buck fever means a state of intense nervousness, excitement. which may be entirely divorced and timidity it may affect a man the first time he has to speak to a large audience just as it may affect him the first time he sees a buck or goes into battle what such a man needs is not courage but never control cool headedness this he can get only by actual practice he must by custom and repeated exercise of self mastery get his nerves thoroughly under control This is largely a matter of habit in the sense of repeated effort and repeated exercise of will power. If the man has the right stuff in him, he will grow stronger and stronger with each exercise of it. You want to get rid of your audience fear? Let us see what causes it. Fear is begotten of ignorance and uncertainty, says Professor Robinson in The Mind in the Making. To put it another way, it is the result of a lack of confidence and what causes that it is the result of not knowing what you can really do and not knowing what you can do is caused by lack of experience when you get a record of successful experience behind you your fears will vanish they will melt like night mist under the glare of a july sun one thing is certain the accepted way to learn to swim is to plunge into the water you have been reading this book long enough Why not toss it aside now and get busy with the real work in hand choose your subject preferably one on which you have some knowledge and construct a 3 minute talk practice the talk by yourself a number of times then give it if possible to the group for whom it is intended or before a group of friends putting into the effort all your force and power in next video we will continue this thank you so much for listening it and i hope it is understandable to you if you enjoy watching my videos do like subscribe and share with your family and friends thank you